around uh, four o'clock. And mm -hmm. after that, you will be the, your next guest. And after that, I will be inside presenting the, the other two guests and a short uh, consideration about uh, the, the issue in Romania. Great. Let's do this way. <clears throat> Hello, Dan. Hello, uh, Re Remus. You are, you are connected. It's okay. Hi. Hi, everybody. Okay. See you. Uh, Bogdan, from from what I heard, uh, Radu will uh, join us shortly. Uh, mm -hmm. Right now, he is in uh, in uh, another conference. Okay. And he, he will uh, uh, that conference. Uh, it's supposed to to finish in two three minutes. It's not a problem because Radu will be the yeah. last who will talk. That means we have all time to wait for him. Yes. Yes. It's okay. I, I, it's okay. Okay, can we start? I think so. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> uh, our round table concentrate today on the topic, which is very important uh, nowadays, especially in the context of social media. <clears throat> it's about uh, the role of conspiracy theories. <clears throat> and we have <clears throat> several uh, nice presentations here. And we will start with uh, Eva Kimmich who is uh, the Professor of Cultural Studies and Cultural Semiotics at the University of Potsdam. She is also Chief Editor of Weltkörper Sprache Journal <clears throat> and uh, currently is dealing with different kinds of social cultural phenomena and issue, for example, conspiracy uh, theories, far right, in order to shed light of them from different, especially cultural semiotics uh, perspectives. That's why it's also very interesting to me, as uh, I'm part of uh, Tartu Moscow, uh, sorry, Tartu uh, University uh, Semiotic Department, uh, which um, mostly based on, at least on theoretical level, uh, on Yuri Lotman's uh, cultural semiotics. <clears throat> so the round is yours, uh, Eva. You can share your slide if you want to. And then after Eva presentation, I will give uh, <clears throat> speech to uh, Bogdan. Thank you very much for your kind uh, invitation and presentation. I just will uh, share my slides. So let, let's start. I just would like to sketch out some results of our research, namely the mechanism of presetting semiosis. Uh, starting 2014 with observing conspiratorial narratives, we focused the so-called alternative news media and social media channels uh, disseminating extreme right-wing populism and uh, conspiratorial ideas. For this purpose, we used a theoretical design combining the model of Lodmanian semiosphere with the concept of sociocultural constructivism in order to reveal how cultural programming is working. We conceived the internet as the technological embodiment of the semiosphere, increasingly becoming the center of all information. It is not not only makes available all kinds of cultural texts and information, but simultaneously constrains the individual to selection and interpretation 
and also to interpretation of interpretations. This results in an unmanageable number of parallel information, diverse interpretations, conspiratorial narratives included, which put the common sense and the common image of reality to the test. Due to the internet's peculiarity to allow communication to take place in seemingly closed spaces, we focused the fact that the process of meaning building can be observed. These otherwise invisible processes of individual semiosis and its emerging interpretations are thus to be viewed as a scene onto which the social semiosis can be shifted. For our analysis, we have chosen amongst others, the web pages, political incorrect news and Klar TV, Klagemauer TV. They notably offer an insight into a purposefully interpretive game with semantic categories. You can find there really all kinds of characteristics ascribed to conspiratorial thinking, its narratives and keywords. Observing these pages, we developed an exemplary model showing how the web page users are given hidden instructions on how to translate and incorporate the revaluation into their personal patterns of interpretation. First of all, it is necessary to introduce elements of common ground with the web page user. These are produced by disposing of some of reality elements such as interpretations generally discussed in media and politics, popular pictures and common citations, as well as an equally important set of semantic differentiations for the revaluation. Once this semantic space is created, a process called grounding can be triggered, meaning that the web page visitor can look for texts compatible with his own fears, hopes, or speculation. Grounding requires mental meeting points. Uh, that is, or they are key words in public of the public discussion. And we, of course, we need also a set of new semantic categories for interpretation and evaluation. The common keywords and the docking keywords of the conspiratorial code text, we use the definition of Marie Lis, um, are given in the so-called guideline of the web page creators. The text in this rubric point out a basic right for information and individual opinion and criticizes the political correctness of the established media, which are, or they claim they are responsible for deficient or falsified information. Distancing themselves as an in-group, the creators underline their commitment for the right of information and individual opinion. I just will shortly draw a sketch of the main political subsphere of democracy supported by adequate semantic categories like tolerance, care, freedom equally, and of course, freedom of press. And what happens by shifting the respective related semantic categories like true, false, political correct and incorrect, is that the named concepts are now put into another light. In consequence, the spreading of individual interpretation generated in an aura of purposeful selected information can now turn into counter categories for evaluation, contesting in this case, the democratic ideas by triggering fear with the spreading of target oriented, oriented information about, for example, a predicated Islamization or the criminality of refugees, the individual will himself produce opposite ideas and reverse criteria of evaluation. Requiring freedom is contested by requiring security. Political correctness is contested by political incorrect information, which is now asserted to tell the reticent truth while the established media attacked as liars and so on. And unfortunately, this uh, model is still working. The same is now happening uh, with Corona. Denying the pandemic, right-wing agitators are claiming the Great Reset as conspiracy, 
They create spaces of possibility in which majorities feel like persecuted minorities. And with this, effective and powerful counter publics come into being. We can first generally note that by intervening in the process of individual meaning building via infiltration of keywords and hidden code texts and reverse semantic categories for interpretation of information, individual semiosis can be preset. Furthermore, within the social media, the user will find confirmation to the statements of other preset users, um, particularly in filter bubbles or, or channels like Telegram. The crux is that the user preset by this means believes that he could have formed his own opinion thanks to the concealed so-called true facts fed to him. Thus, by presetting the individual semiosis, and that's my conclusion, the trust in state and scientific authorities can be undermined and is more and more undermined and dubious representations more and more overlap social accepted above all factual realities. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Eva. And I think uh, we will discuss about uh, your presentation uh, later after uh, all will present their uh, presentation, then we have some time for discussion. So <coughs> please, uh, Pogdan. <coughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, I want to introduce uh, Professor uh, Remus Prikopie, the rector of uh, our university, for a short presentation. Please. Thank you, Bogdan. Hi, everyone. I finally succeeded to join the conference. <clears throat> and unfortunately, at uh, four, I have uh, another meeting. But uh, I wanted to participate with a short intervention on this uh, session because uh, as an educator and also as a former Minister of Education in Romania, I have heard many times when something is wrong in our society or in our societies, the explanation is education. Education which is not appropriate, education which is not fit for uh, today and so on. Probably you've heard also uh, the same uh, uh, approach in uh, different um, discourses. Uh, I'm not going to uh, deny this, but I'm going to put some additional questions. What kind of education? We are speaking about uh, kindergarten, uh, primary, about uh, higher education, about uh, continuing education, about the education of journalists, about the education of scientists, because uh, sometimes if we talk about vaccination, who should teach society about vaccination? Where we should introduce these topics in our educational process? And here it's a very complex approach which we have to realize. And let me just uh, share with you a fact. So it's not a conclusion, it's not a theory, it's a fact. When this pandemic exploded uh, also in Romania, I noticed in our TV shows, talk shows, the majority of people speaking about coronavirus were not people trained or educated on topics like medical issues or crisis situations or whatever. So specialists on, I don't know which field, they knew exactly how the pandemic situation has uh, uh, appeared uh, about uh, you know, the lab experiment experiences and so on. <clears throat> so probably the first place where we have to work is the education of journalists, because there are some rules and some principles that we have to follow when we serve public opinion, we serve our audiences. And as journalists, we have to know what kind of voices to um, uh, uh, put forward. Also, probably it's a matter of education of our medical doctors or our specialists. I remember Umberto Eco, and for sure you know very well, how many publications he prepared for the general public. 
not for the most sophisticated uh, philosopher in the world. Also, if we do a list of the one, top 100 specialists on virusology, and if we look at their scientific work, we'll find probably for sure a lot of scientific um, um, papers, articles, books. And I would be curious, I didn't do this, to see how many general audience conferences they ever uh, did in their career. And this is another topic which our schools of communication generally neglect. Um, science communication. Science communication, which should be something very uh, important in our uh, schools, and we should interact with different other colleges and universities, and somehow to underline the fact that never mind you are an engineer, you are an architecture, you are, an, a, I don't know, biologist or medical doctor, you have among your responsibilities as a professional in this field to speak for the general public, what we are doing, and we are promoting this in universities. We are promoting the dialogue among the best. In my uh, prof professional portfolio, this conference is more important, in fact, is important, because if I go to speak with high school pupils uh, about um, my field of specialization, this is not considered something which you provided as a university professor and as a researcher in the field of uh, social science. So what I would like to underline is the fact that when we have problems, and uh, we say education, in fact, is the uh, root of this problem, social problem. Maybe we have to uh, uh, look in a broader way uh, in the general idea of education, because even us as university professor and researchers and scientists, we have to look at our education and not primary, not university degree, not PhD, but how we understand our responsibility to do our daily job. In a conclusion, because I am uh, the rector of uh, National University of Political Studies and Public Administration, we discussed during the beginning of the pandemic situation, what, how can we help? Are we a medical school? No. Are we, a, I don't know, a specialist in something that can help uh, biology or whatever to produce a, a, a vaccine? No. But we all tried to speak about the value of communication and the value of selecting appropriate voices. Because when you have the medical doctors, but knowing how to speak to the general population about the pandemic situation and the vaccine, probably they will be able to persuade the general population to, to do the appropriate actions in order to reduce the pandemic. I'll stop here. I already had a longer intervention than I expected. And thank you, uh, Bogdan, uh, and uh, the colleagues who organized this session for inviting me for this uh, short intervention. Thank you very much. Andreas, please present yeah. your next guest. Yeah. Uh, our next uh, guest is Marius Madison uh, from Tartu University, where uh, she works as a researcher of semiotics. And uh, his research, uh, <coughs> her research interest lies primarily on cultural semiotics, media semiotics, and political semiotics. Uh, and uh, she defended his uh, PhD in 2016 on uh, semiotic construction of identities in hypermedia. Uh, environments uh, where she analyzed online communication of Estonian extreme right. And uh, just last year, she also published uh, a book under Routledge, the Strategic Conspiracy Narratives, a Semiotic Approach. So please, <coughs> the crown is yours, Marilis. Thank you very much, Andreas. I'm very pleased to be here. And uh, I'm glad that I have a chance to speak after Remus, because actually, uh, my talk um, uh, starts uh, with, um, with the book launch that we didn't have 
to, to this coronavirus situation. Of course, we planned to have a book launch when, when the book came out, um, but then um, we only had many, many invitations to give interviews and introduce our book in, in public in, in certain webinars and seminars and also, yes, uh, just via interviews to Estonian journalists and also we had some international coverage. And um, while, uh, while speaking about conspiracy theories and our research in, in, in a popularizing way that we hoped uh, was understandable for many people, we often heard questions uh, that were somewhat surprising and uh, uh, that uh, made us see the patterns of certain conspiracy myths uh, that yes, coronavirus infodemic uh, triggered many conspiracy theories. Many people started uh, speaking about conspiracy theories, and we can say that they became sort of a trendy buzzword. And uh, not only people who are usually popularizing science were interested in our works, but also like some tabloids and some entertainment uh, portals reached out. And um, and yes, we understood that actually those sources um, and also like uh, debunking websites or debunkers, they treat conspiracy theories and their social cultural influence in hugely varying senses uh, that sometimes contradict to each other. And, uh, and in this talk, I want to highlight those conspiracy myths or myths related to conspiracy theories. And I want to stress that they are neither right or wrong, um, as in case of um, with any myths, um, um, but uh, they are reductive modes of thinking of certain topics. And they tend to, you know, view conspiracy theorizing as with electric torch by emphasizing certain tendencies and yet um, obscuring some others. And, and yes, that was the book where it all started, <laughs> but now I, I turn to those conspiracy myths. And the first one is related uh, with the belief that only be people on the fringe engage in conspiracy theorizing. And uh, especially in, in tabloids and in entertainment portals, and also the journalists of those uh, sources, they often ask in their, in their questions that, um, yes, like, like what, how do a real conspiracy theorist look like? And um, we know those images of people with tinfoil hats. We know the image of crazy conspiracy wall with red eyed people on the back that paint uh, certain caricatures of those people that uh, conspiracy theorists are believed to be um, um, marginal. Uh, they are <laughs> sometimes they are associated with social media groups, which is, of course, not wrong exactly because many conspiracy theorists meet each other in social media and they often become radicalized. Uh, but yes, those um, stereotypic visions depict them as certain out of touch characters who suffer from their ID fixes. And um, uh, the, the, um, yes, the weakness of that myth uh, relies in the fact that if you think of conspiracy theories and conspiracy theorists by using those stereotypes, then uh, less vivid versions of conspiracy theories, uh, they become obscure or people don't recognize them as conspiracy theories. And that's what happened with this pandemic documentary where a person who, who presented herself as a medical doctor or a doctor PhD uh, actually became a narrator of conspiracy theories. Uh, so the second myth <laughs> that I wanted to introduce that is somewhat uh, related with the first one is that only people with strong conspiracy beliefs uh, tend to spread conspiracy theories. And um, yes, it is uh, related with the fact that social networking sites make it very easy to grasp the popularity 
uh, of conspiracy theory. We can measure through different likes, shares and comments how many people are informed about certain conspiracy ideas and, and we can tell by certain uh, certain strength that yes, those are the most trending conspiracy topics, those are the conspiracy passwords. And there is a lot of talk in media, uh, but also in scientific circles of eco chambers of radical conspiracy theorists, and Eva mentioned them too. And I am 100% sure that those eco chambers exist. Uh, when I conducted my studies about Estonian extreme right, I also saw that um, there are those groups whose views become more radicalized uh, if they interact with each other, if they circulate their conspiracy ideas, they, they tend to become more and more extreme. And, uh, and like a lot of empirical research has been done on, on that topic, and it has been confirmed that especially in right wing circles, those echo chambers really exist. Uh, but it doesn't mean that all conspiracy theories that are out there in social networking sites, uh, that they are part of echo chambers. And of course, uh, <laughs> journalists sometimes tend to overemphasize the, the, the panic or the worry that we should all have about conspiracy theories. And it is often um, said something like this, that contemporary netizens are suffering from unprecedentedly strong, unprecedentedly strong fear of conspiracies, that we are afraid of conspiracies and, and we all like believe at least one of them. But uh, actually what studies show and what, uh, what my research and Andreas's research also show is that um, a considerable number of those who visit those conspiracy sites they don't have strong conspiracy beliefs, but they often entertain their half cynical, half serious attitudes to conspiracy theories. Conspiracy theories uh, are often consumed as uh, certain speculations. They have this entertaining quality and, um, and definitely there is much in common in between gossip and, uh, and rumors and conspiracy theories, they are just exciting and people want to articulate their social fantasies with the means of conspiracy theories. And uh, one of the downsides of that myth is that uh, they often uh, draw attention away from a strategic disseminators of conspiracy theories uh, who are uh, circulating those theories with their own purposes and who don't necessarily sincerely believe them, but they just tend to spread them. And it is important to, to notice that those sources are out there as well. And uh, the third myth uh, is most uh, related with our uh, book topic. Uh, in our book, we studied strategic conspiracy narratives. And uh, when we spoke about strategic uh, conspiracy theories, then often, uh, journalists asked us, um, are the strategic actors or their spin doctors or their PR teams, are they inventing popular viral conspiracy theories? Do they know the X factor that kind of starts, <laughs> starts flying on social media? And uh, if I want to summarize the myth, then, uh, then yes, it can be um, said in that line that PR specialists create the theories ex nihilo and successfully plant them in social networking sites. And uh, the fallibility of that myth lies in the fact that actually in their essence, conspiracy theories are a vernacular phenomena. It is very hard to put the finger on the start of conspiracy theory because they repeat very similar motives that yes, can be filled with context specific references and new villains. Uh, but still those motives are that society has become infested with malignant forces, that there are there is brainwashing going on or that inf in important information or crucial information is hidden from the public or that conspirators are using a secret code. 
So uh, yes, often those uh, often those slots are filled with context specific references and and strategic actors use conspiracy theories. And what do they do? Is that uh, they often it often works the other way around. They don't plant those theories or they don't invent those theories, but they go to social networking sites and they search for trendy villain figures and hot passwords of those conspiracy theories that they want to, you know, connect their strategic messages with. And on that slide, I have uh, <laughs> I have an image from one Estonian advertisement uh, that uses the stereotype of this flat earth theory. And it is called in Estonian, it is written that we believe in flat stomach theory. And as we can see, there, there really is a flat stomach here <laughs> present and and they are uh, just making fun with that stereotype but that is a very easy example often uh, strategic actors either political parties or certain enterprises they want to use those stereotypes even more profound way so in conclusion <laughs> i would like to say that our book demonstrates that conspiracy theories can be used for different strategic purposes and strategic games, and uh, they definitely cannot be all measured with the same stick. And we try to unite uh, the ideas of Tartu Moscow School of Semiotics and Echo's model author, model reader, and, and create a framework that on one hand uh, uh, enables us to be uh, context sensitive and study you know, the specifics of each conspiracy narrative and not narrow them down. But on the other hand, we really think that uh, it also enables to explicate the invariant mechanisms that all conspiracy narratives have in common. Thank you for, for your attention. Thank you very much, Marilis. <clears throat> so, Bogdan, you can introduce your next presenter. Before I'm introducing my colleagues, I want to say some words about uh, those topics in, from a Romanian point of view. Starting from the reality of the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, which was not a premiere from the point of view of a globally spreading disease, but brought a significant number of novelties and generated a significant number of challenges. One of the most relevant lies in, within its universal nature. So far, it has been inappropriate to talk about humanity, but humanities. When the plague hit Europe, the Americas didn't even, did, didn't even know we existed. When the Mongols destroyed China, the African kingdoms were relaxed and the Europeans found out after more than half a year later. The first someone, somehow, global moment was World War II, with global consequences and changes that influenced the entire world. Yet, even at that moment, there were areas of the world little or not at all affected by the Great Conflagration. Now humanity is linked through social networks across the heads of states, governments, and ideologies. At the same time, any corner of the world was connected to, glo uh, to global evolutions, but also became the acknowledged target of any other corner of the world. The pandemics was the core topic of uh, action of the government everywhere, but also the core topic of discussion for every citizen. Probably there has never been such a dominant subject in the public area being approached explicitly or in correlation with other components of the social life. As in any institutional communication, two clear lines can be found here, the official communication and the alternative to it. The official communication, at least in Romania, was divided between the governmental one, the one of the epidemiological and emergency structures, and the political one, of course, the, the ruling party. The medical communication essentially referred to, uh, to the way the disease is, is evolving throughout the country and possible novelties regarding treatments. The governmental communication referred to the measures to be adopted and observed in order to fight against the pandemics. And the political one was to identify the faults for the situation we are into. Speaking of faults, we refer to an, an internal fault that means the parties and organizations that could be held liable for the situation of the medical structures in Romania at the time of the pandemic outbreak, but also the public presentation of those in failure to comply with the rules and laws already in place, endanger the health and li uh, lives of other fellow citizens, 
And also we refer to external faults, the source of the virus, blocking the import of medicine and equipment necessary to fight the pandemics, the poor reaction of some external partners and so on. As for against the official line of communication, another one was carried out at the same level, but obviously in the opposite direction. First of all, in the medical field, numerous alternative theories occurred regarding the virus that went from denying it its existence to minimizing its impact, it identifying a global plan, plan aimed to resetting civilization, abolishing the rights and freedom of entire populations, killing certain age categories, mandating 5G technology and so on. In each of these of those scenarios, a perpetrator was appointed that in most cases comprised country political leaders in addition to a powerful external manipulator. Against governmental communication, the opposition parties, civil society organization, parts of the media generated a line of communication challenging the proposed measures defined as the restriction of the freedom referred to in the constitution. At the same time, acts of corruption in the purchase of medical supplies in the context of pandemic were highlighted. This resulted into an important narrative that claimed that severity of the consequences of the virus to be exaggerated precisely in order to be able to purchase unnecessarily massive amounts of medical supplies. The political communication was the most blunt also, also because Romania was in an election year, holding local and parliamentary, parliamentary elections. The parties accused each other of both pandemic management as well as past or present corruption acts. On all fronts, the developed theories may fall under the idea of conspiracy, either global or local, and each of the parts attending the public debates strove to generate in the public area the face of a collective enemy to blame and to settle the fears and frustration of the population. In the presentation that will follow, my colleagues, uh, Dan Sultanescu, which is associate professor at uh, uh, our university and research director of the Center of Civic Participation and Democracy, and Radu Kukuta, lecturer in strategic studies, will present approaches regarding both the way the conspiracy theories generated by the pandemics affected the political fight in Romania, as well as the way in which the political discourse was oriented in this period towards finding global enemies. Dan, please. Hello. Um, I will try to share my presentation in just a second. OK. So uh, in my presentation, I will try to add some uh, Romanian data to our discussion, because I think uh, it's, uh, um, it's something that can complete or uh, add uh, very, very well to, to the things that was said uh, before by Remus or uh, by Marilis. And uh, probably later we will we'll, we'll can discuss about, uh, about uh, the results. Uh, the conspiracy theories uh, tend to circulate more during these uh, periods of intense crisis and the COVID pandemic is obviously one such period. Uh, the alternative stories fulfill people's needs uh, for knowledge, control, or having a positive self-image. Uh, that official explanations, often too complex or abstract, cannot satisfy. Uh, people's increased focus on social networks and the online environment in general contributed to higher circulation and the uh, impact of these conspiracy theories during the current pandemic. Our explanation is based on people's difficulty to distinguish official explanations from other sources of information. Uh, another reason is based on some people's predisposition to reject information from experts. And both, uh, both these mechanisms are strongly enabled in the online environment. Uh, the early days of the pandemic in uh, um, April last year, uh, we at our center were interested in the proliferation of conspiracy narratives in Romania. So we looked both at the public's reaction to conspiracy narratives and at the content being distributed uh, uh, online. First, we conducted several surveys in several key moments to measure the level of Romanians believing conspiracy narratives. And using some uh, several tools for secondary analysis, uh, we were interested to see how this type of belief is associated with trust in key political actors, since Romania tends to be a battleground for, um, of narratives from the West and the East, and several geopolitical powers try to use the pandemic to undermine trust in the West uh, all across Europe. 
We uh, looked uh, also at the way conspiracy narratives might influence people's tendency to respect health recommendations from the authorities. And uh, for example, looking at our survey results, we found, found that 70% uh, of the respondents uh, believed at least one of the conspiracy narratives we tested, uh, the artificial creation of COVID-19 that is uh, currently debated, uh, was the most widely shared belief by two thirds of the public. Uh, but also 50% of the population also believe that COVID-19 was planned by big pharma and the powerful enemies. Uh, even the more eccentric theory connecting uh, COVID with uh, 5G networks uh, was shared by almost one in five Romanians. Uh, for a more in-depth uh, uh, look, uh, we perform analysis on our survey results and uh, we dis discovered, for example, that public that trusts Russia, it's more inclined to believe conspiracy narratives and the public uh, that trusts the European Union or United States is less inclined to believe conspiracy narratives. Uh, we tested also a very complex regression model and uh, found that people with increased conspiracy beliefs are less concerned and have less correct knowledge about the pandemic and the virus. Also, the less concerned or worst informed are less likely to comply with health regulations. And uh, in our regression model, we, we found uh, some uh, direct connections. Uh, conspiracy beliefs decreases, with, for example, with trust in the European Union and education. Uh, they increase with trust in Russia, populist attitudes, and trust in Facebook. Knowledge, correct knowledge about COVID decreases when conspiracy beliefs are high, but increases with media use. Uh, concern also decreases when conspiracy beliefs are high, but increases with knowledge, age, and trust in institutions. Uh, compliance with COVID-19 guidelines uh, increases with correct knowledge about uh, the, the COVID-19 and the concern about the virus. Uh, the, the second part, we also focused on the, uh, some actual conspiracy content disseminated online in Romania. One of the most interesting cases we looked uh, was uh, ivermectin. Uh, this is the anti-parasite drug uh, used mostly by the vets uh, that has been touted as a miracle drug that first cures COVID, act as an alternative to vaccine, and it is rejected by the authorities because it is cheap and undermines big pharma profits. Uh, these narratives gain traction in the public space, despite the fact that the health authorities warned against uh, its use for COVID. Uh, looking at the components of this narrative, we noticed first the obvious conspiracy elements, big pharma and anti-vaccine uh, message, uh, but also some more plausible elements, like the fact that it's a cheap drug already authorized and in use uh, in Europe and uh, United States, and already used by notorious doctors to treat COVID. This combination is far from uh, other eccentric conspiracies like 5G allegation, uh, since, uh, since it uh, relies on plausible information and verifiable data. Uh, they lend legitimacy to the entire theory, thus making it borderline conspiratorial with a mainstream reach. This borderline quality helps it disseminate more easily. Although this narrative has been pushed primarily by conspiracy and anti-vaccine influencers, there are also many mainstream voices talking about it, from alternative doctors to opportunistic politicians to media and TV personalities looking for ratings. Uh, we see here the total number of mentions about uh, this drug, ivermectin, over a five month period in uh, Romanian online media. Uh, what is noticeable from this graph is that the number of mentions on Facebook, shown in blue, uh, almost continuously surpasses the number of mentions in online press, uh, the newspapers, shown in red. Uh, this means that the issue was much, much more debated on Facebook than in uh, online media articles. Also, we tried to collect uh, a lot of data and uh, uh, here we use data related to all Romanian Facebook groups mentioning ivermectin in the last five months and uh, build a network analysis to look at the pattern of dissemination of these Facebook posts. Uh, the nodes are Facebook groups, 
And uh, the similarly, uh, similarly colored nodes are communities inside the, uh, a larger network grouped together by the links they shared. Uh, this illustration shows us the disparate quality of this network. The conversation about ivermectin in Romania is not isolated in just a few groups. On the contrary, it's a debated, uh, um, in, it, it is debated in a pl plurality of groups, some clusters, other peripheral, uh, with different interests and uh, orientation. Um, one of the, our conclusion is that the pro-Ivermectin content is disseminated more than the anti-Ivermectin content in uh, Facebook. Uh, the Facebook uh, is uh, the perfect playground uh, where such narratives easily become viral. Looking at the top 30 Facebook posts and their authors in Romania, we noticed that TV and social media supported each other. Since, since most of the influencers in this list, probably not only by the Romanians participating in this panel, uh, the, the influencers in this list became visible uh, by constantly appear, appearing on uh, mainstream uh, TV. Uh, looking beyond Romania, uh, also were, we, uh, we were interested to see how the global online conversation about ivermectin looks like. Uh, this data illustrates the global search interest for this issue from Google Trends. Notice the geographical areas where the interest was most concentrated. In Latin and Central America, where treatment has been approved and used in 2020, uh, Lebanon, South Africa, Slovakia, Bulgaria, and Romania. There are no influential European or North American countries in this list. The issue developed only in geopolitical peripheries. Coming back to uh, Facebook data, uh, we look at uh, the ivermectin post gathering most interactions globally in the last five months. Most pages are from Brazil, but also Peru or Bolivia. The posts highlighted in yellow are from Romania. We have two posts from Romania about, uh, among these uh, top uh, 50 uh, Facebook posts that received the most interactions globally. Thus, looking at the ivermectin conversation from two perspectives, uh, who performs online searches about it and who posts about it on Facebook, we find similar geographical results. And Romania is in, uh, on both of these lists. Coming to a conclusion, what is the lesson here? First, first lesson from studying the public's attitude is that belief in conspiracy narratives is stronger in those groups which are also most vulnerable to anti-Western propaganda. Belief in conspiracy narrative has the potential to lead to risky behaviors, such as disregard for official health regulations. And the second lesson from looking at the dissemination of such narratives on social media, it is that the most dangerous conspir uh, conspiracy theories are the ones that include uh, plausible elements, which helps, uh, helps them gain legitimacy and access to mainstream communicators and mainstream audiences. In both perspective, the dissemination of conspiracy narratives is associated with eroded trust in authorities and the predisposition to distrust official explanation. I will uh, stop here and uh, we'll discuss it later. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, inviting Radu Kukuta to make his presentation after that we can have our uh, discussions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, and uh, um, thank, I want to thank the organizers for setting up this event. Uh, now, um, in brutal honesty, uh, the starting point of my um, ideas were actually the seminars I had last week with uh, last year when the pandemic was in its uh, inception with uh, a group of my students and we were discussing uh, for, a, for a couple of weeks witchcraft oracles and magic among the Zande, even Spritchard's book about um, the Zande population. Now, um, in as much as conspiracy theories are concerned, one of the aspects that was, like, caught my mind was um, the gap between the um, public expectations in regards to the reality of modern science on the one hand and uh, the actual reality of peer-reviewed research. Um, and this points to a larger 
you know, like theoretical and epistemological, epistemological problem we have about, you know, like social sciences reliability to make predictions and to base public policies upon said predictions, because in as much as we are discussing the meanings, the intersubjective meanings of the pandemics, we are discussing not necessarily a biological event, but rather a social event, which is caught in the process of social construction, uh, uh, attributing meaning and uh, uh, relevant social interactions. Uh, the logic of the conspiracy theory, to my mind, and in as much as the Romanian context is concerned, was rather opposed to the logic of scientific discovery. But structurally, I do not think that uh, uh, the patterns that were involved in, you know, like the production of scientific truth and the production of, I don't know, conspiratorial truth were rather that different. Um, do they play different social roles? And uh, this is probably where my colleague Dan has answered the question, what are the circumstances and what is their intensity? I think that this is the problem that we, oh, that this is the hypothesis that we need to look at further on. Uh, at the same time, uh, one of the things that, you know, like really caught my mind and I think that should be factored in, the, factored in, in this discussion is the problem of the meaning of information. Uh, as far as I can tell, there is no objectively neutral, self-evident information. Uh, as Mr. Wenzel wrote in a 2008 article, you know, like discourse is everything, uh, quoting Laclau. Uh, I stumbled upon the article, uh, uh, but I kind of went further, you know, again, uh, uh, my thinking right now is rather more Foucault inspired. Um, now, the problem is essentially that in as much as conspiracy theories in Romania are, are, are concerned, the interpretation of information is intrinsic to information itself. Now, another issue that uh, uh, I am dealing with is, and I am looking at the, uh, I am looking at the problem of uh, international relations theory because this is the field I deal with. The biggest problem with international relations theory in as much as we are talking about the scientific social sciences uh, 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 power of approaching the pandemic is that our theoretical apparatus, to my to my knowledge and to my understanding, has proven of little value in explaining or in helping us understand the development of the pandemic. Um, a handful of years ago, uh, Daniel Dresner was somehow derided when he wrote theories of international politics and zombies. But to my knowledge, this is the uh, uh, only attempt that has been made in international relations to capture the consequences of a global pandemic. Definitely zombies are not viruses, but uh, a, a number of the issues and the number of the problems that are posed there are still relevant. And we see them in the political interaction nowadays. For example, if we take realist theory, it is undoubtable, it is undeniable that uh, for a large number of countries, the pandemic has been an, uh, uh, or the, 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 the epidemic context has been a context in which issues of relative power were concerned and were the basis when making foreign policy decisions. In spite of what liberals might argue, and in spite, as Mr. Uh, Professor Teodorescu had argued, the global dimension of the pandemic, there were calls to collect to global collective action, but little global collective action in dealing with the pandemic. Now, I'm not saying that the uh, 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 realist cause has been uh, 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 uphold, has been upheld by the by the pandemic. Uh, but I am arguing that to a large degree, you know, like the predictions we can make or the public policies that we can build based on, you know, like what theories uh, uh, predict are uh, uh, not necessarily of little value, but were rather inaccurate. Of course, we can talk about the COVAX scheme, which would highlight the global capacity for cooperation. But the reality is that in discursive terms, if we look at world leaders, if we look even at the problem of the origin of the virus and the dispute surrounding it, the problem is that the conceptualization of the pandemic, both in uh, uh, official public policy answers and at the same time, both in conspiratorial terms, has been widely state centric. There is a significant attachment, both in conspiracy theories and in the official answer, to the 
uh, uh, myth of Westphalian state-based sovereign, uh, sovereign political entities. Another uh, factor that, uh, or another problem that I want to highlight is the problem of securitization. Uh, this kind of uh, approaches the idea that Mr. Wenzel wrote about in 2008, but from a different perspective. Uh, it has a wholly different theoretical underpinning. It is based on Austin's idea of uh, um, uh, language acts. And the main problem with the pandemic is that for several intrinsic and extrinsic reasons, it is very difficult to securitize. It is definitely clear that the pandemic has been the object of uh, uh, an official discourse and an, uh, 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 an official speech act. But due to some previously existing interpretations, the pandemic couldn't be securitized as, for example, terrorism or the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, destruction or even migration previously had been. Um, now, I'm not saying that securitization theory is wrong, but I'm saying that the pandemic has definitely opened another window into some form of speech acts, which while concerning security, have proven themselves in so far unamenable to securitization. Um, last but not least, in as much as uh, uh, the international re relation theories are concerned, uh, I think that the pandemic has highlighted to a large extent the uh, uh, already, you know, like widely debated irrelevance of geopolitics in the sense that both in the approaches to the pandemic uh, and in the uh, 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 expected outcomes, it is very difficult to build out, to, to make a, a significantly relevant variable out of geography uh, outside the, 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 the handful of cases of uh, 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 islands which were uh, better protected from the pandemic, it is very difficult to draw some conclusions as to the influence of geography over politics. Now, the last part of uh, my uh, 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 presentation, and I want to humbly apologize for not having my ideas put into a you know, like clear order, is um, the problem of the power of science and uh, uh, the protest, the anti, and this is where the anti-pandemic protests in Romania, to my mind, highlight a very important issue. On the one hand, they were dealing with matters of discourse. When the protesters marching through Bucharest were yelling down with the pandemics, it's, uh, it's not only that they were contesting the public policy measures which were decided, but to a significant degree, they were contesting the act of power by which the pandemic had become a social reality. And in this sense, this leads me to uh, uh, Foucault's idea of uh, uh, contesting the, uh, uh, and I'm not saying that we should do that, but I'm saying that this mechanism was embedded within Romanian conspiracy theories. The undermining of expert voices was in a sense equated to the uh, uh, contestation of a system which was thoroughly associated with political power. So I'm not saying that Foucault is right, and I'm not saying that the protesters had read Foucault, but to a large extent, they kind of agreed with him. The police, uh, 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 as Foucault said, the police includes everything. And in a sense, their criticism of the official mechanisms of truth production, of truth legitimation, and the apparatuses that, uh, 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 that uh, 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 ensure this production and its uh, uh, internal normalization in society were contested by these conspiratorial narratives inspired protests. Uh, the last thing I wanted to uh, 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 discuss about whether is whether um, the transition that Foucault talked about from uh, uh, um, the, the transition uh, towards a society of, uh, towards social control, which Hart and Negri talked about has been really finalized. Because to my mind, this process of uh, uh, generalization and intensification of the apparatuses of normalizing disciplinarity hasn't been concluded. And the protests and the proliferation of conspiracy theories which legitimize these processes highlights the fact that this transition, which Foucault uh, 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 um, equated was like with the modern period, is still larger and incomplete. And I don't think that, and I think that the conspiracy theories, in a sense, validate the idea that the inter interiorization and the normalization hasn't been yet concluded. Uh, 
Thank you very much for your attention. And I do expect your questions. Thank you very much for having me here. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Radu. Please, Andreas took the... Yeah. <clears throat> Now we can uh, start our discussion. We have not uh, very much time anymore, but still, uh, maybe someone have a question to each other. <clears throat> uh, maybe some specific uh, specifying questions. Yeah, please. Yes, I have a very practical question to you and the Marilis. Uh, where can I buy the book? Marilis, hey, we can send it to you. If you want, we can send you the PDF. It can be bought from the Routledge, but the price is ridiculous. We don't suggest anyone buying it, only libraries. <laughs> uh, so you can type your email and, and we will send you. Thank you so much, because uh, it's something that uh, can be very useful to, to include in our, in our approaches in the future. Yeah. Right. Be really interesting to hear your feedback. Other questions? I have a question to Eva. Yep, All right. uh, I wrote it in the chat. Um, so what do you think uh, about uh, Francois Rastier's interpretation of uh, George Agamben's theories of uh, objective conspiracy in the context of infodemics and uh, disinformation? Um, according to Rastier, uh, it's a time for, uh, for storytelling and the time for storytelling must give the way to the principle of reality. So it's uh, an opinion of Rastier, what do you think about? Um, do, do you mean that there are uh, conspiracy theories uh, which are real? It's that the point you want to uh, Yes, um, it is uh, the point of view of Rastier about the conspiracy theories of Agamben, presented mm -hmm. uh, by Agamben. Mm -hmm. hmm. I don't uh, really, we are working uh, empirically uh, mostly on this social uh, media and we are um, making a difference between in the term, uh, using the, uh, the, the notion of conspiracy theory we don't use anymore uh, because it is um, a notion um, but theory, a theory can or is something about real uh, facts. So when you use narrative and uh, myths, you all already uh, intend to show that it it's just a story about something. So I think it's a terminological. It's the ter the terms which are important to, mm. to make to make the difference. Because, because all is knowledge about something which is told. It's, it, it's stories about something and there are stories which can be true and there are other stories which um, change truth somehow. Thank you, Eva, for your yeah. intervention and for answer, but I, I think I don't have time to, to discussion. It's already uh, time to close our panel. So uh, the discussion and intervention is, uh, is very uh, tender, and I suggest that you keep in touch and uh, exchange an idea in the future. Thank you all, and mm -hmm. I invite you to the next panel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nicolau. Thank, Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.